Boomers on the storm. Boomers in the pool. Into this pool we've cannonballed. 401k. I've got double boomer on and check out that island there baby i'm double boomered today welcome we're back in boomer town florida and we're enjoying the 80 degree weather as opposed to tennessee's abominable snowman weather abomination snowman oh the obama the uh the Ob- abominable snowman that was my worst Obama ever. Uh, the Obama, <clears throat> you see, the, the abominable snowman. Where'd my Obama go, dude? I can't even do it anymore. <clears throat> uh, uh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? The, the abominable snowman. I don't know. Maybe I just can't do Obama anymore. Anyway, welcome. Uh, we will be taking Super Chats. Those are always welcome. We're already getting five dollars from New England Post, and thank you. May your May your New Year be blessed and red pilled. Maris Toro, what are you gonna do? Uh, Trump Trump talks about he's gonna he's gonna build a wall. Uh, you know Trump says he's gonna he's gonna bring back jobs. How how are you gonna do that? You gonna wave a, a magic wand? How are you gonna do that? Yes, blessed red pill New Year. We're double Florida boomered up. I got a 802K with these shirts on, not a 401K, a 802K. Booming in my 802Ks, 802Ks booming in the way. <laughs> Listening to that boomer rap. Actually, yeah, I mean, if you listen to. Smoking in dough, sipping on gin and juice, laid back. You're basically a boomer. That's like, if you listen to that rap, you're essentially a boomer. We're going to talk about esoteric Hollywood deuce. We're going to drop a deuce on esoteric Hollywood. And yes, I'm still, I still have, we're going to still make the 1800s great again. Like Wyatt Earp style. With these hideous sideburns. Actually, they go down to here, but you can't. My sideburns are coming in weird. Make the 1800s great again, dog. We're still on that tip. We're still on that tip. But I want to talk about the book with you guys tonight. Happy New Year's, Evan Schultz. Thank you so much. You guys are <clears throat> You guys are so generous i really appreciate it it is this is is this new year's will i be dang to this i didn't even realize it <laughs> maybe we'll have to go i thought i don't know i don't know what i thought uh maybe we'll have to go like a midnight stream we'll have to drop the ball you dropped the ball on me what are you what are you gonna do you you gonna drop a ball what, what, what are you gonna do I am turning into Florida, man. Dude, look at this. I'm going to be on the news for uh, putting steroids into alligators and trying to rob the alligator park by dosing up the alligators and training them to help me rob the alligator park. And then it'll say, it'll say, Florida man attempts to rob alligator park by giving alligators testosterone and training them to help him rob the alligator park which actually somebody did try recently to (laughs) rob the alligator park uh not the brightest criminal he ended up jumping over the fence this is a true story Uh, local news jumped over the fence into the alligator park and he knew what this place was what a dummy maybe he was on gator meth Jay is an O-Boomer fan. Obama's almost a boomer, isn't he? Might as well be. 
He's in that he's in that worldview. He's in that frame of mind. All right, we got 141 nerds already here. Seven minutes of nonsense, and we're already 141 nerds. What are you gonna do? <laughs> what, what, what are you gonna do? Gonna be huge, huge. I gotta work on the Trump again. I haven't even done a Trump impersonation in forever. I don't even remember how Trump talks. It's been so long since I since I heard any uh, Trump speeches. Yes, shout out to uh, Alternate Current Radio. Is that non sequitur? The our uh, skeptical atheist friends, non sequitur. Is that who that is? Let's see if that's the. Is that the real? No, it's not. That's not the real non sequitur. We will be Theo Theo Vaughn representing. <laughs> he? He's got a mullet, doesn't he? But he doesn't have double fucking boomer shirts. He don't got double boomer shirts. Double boomer shirts. We're going to talk about my second book. Woo, Lord, I couldn't believe they'd be a second book. Woo. Woo. It's getting hot. I'm going to start crying, get clamp, y'all, because there's a second book out. Oh, and all them haters, all them haters said, you ain't never going to have a book. You ain't never going to have a TV show. You ain't never going to mount to nothing. And I just... Oh, Lord, I just proved all them wrong. But, yeah, no, we already sold out of my initial batch, dude. They went in four days. Gone. The the first batch. Gone in four days. Gone in 60 seconds. More like gone in four days. Uh, But we're going to talk about the book tonight. This, This one is actually allocated for our friend, Mr. KJ. Friend of the show over at the gigantic YouTube channel, Scariest Movie Ever, our friend KJ. I want to give a shout out to KJ. Uh, he's going to be having me on soon. We, we did a show, if you recall, when Esoteric Hollywood 1 came out. It was a, it was a cool show. Uh, he's going to love this book right up his alley. He's really been putting out some great videos lately. If you haven't seen KJ's videos lately, man, they're like the bomb. But also his live streams are really funny too, by the way. He's been cracking me up, cracking me up with his uh, his crazy news stories. They're hilarious, uh, and his comedy analysis Seth Rogen video was really good. Like, what the heck is up with this crazy comedy? Uh, his witches videos about millennial Hollywood witches, good stuff. Definitely uh, check out KJ's videos over at Scariest Movie Ever, and listen to our uh, interview from last year that did really good. I think. Got about uh, twenty or thirty thousand on his channel, and got about twenty or thirty thousand on my channel of that interview. Uh, really cool interview we did. So he'll be getting his book soon, but we're gonna infect it with boomer dust. We're gonna let me. I'm gonna shake out some boomer dandruff on the book for KJ. Look at all that boomer dandruff on there. Disgusting. Disgusting. Magical boomer dandruff dust. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna pour some Coors light on it later. What's the most boomer beer? Is it like silver bullet boomer? What's Coors Light? When I think of like the most boomer beer, it's Coors Light, isn't it? Is there anything more boomer than Coors Light beer? What do you guys think? What's the most boomer beer? Because hipsters, millennials. They're all micro, micro brew, micro brew, bro. I've been brewing for about four years and I've got the biggest freaking beer gut now. Everybody who starts micro brewing grows a giant, Milwaukee's beast, that's it. They grow giant uh, Coors, Milwaukee beast, that's Thai. Milwaukee beast and, and Coors is tied for, like my, my uncle's a boomer uh, and he's always drinking cheap beer and it's he's Coors he's a Coors dude why did we we didn't mean to I didn't mean to do that get off of here there's an ugly double boomer double boomer talking to me looks just like me double boom boomer double barrel boomer (laughs) it's a double barrel boomer 
A double barrel boomer shotgun shoots dandruff out at you. <laughs> the jokes are all free. I'll be here all week. <laughs> I'm here all week. I hear Owen Benjamin said he likes the content. Well, thank you, Owen. Uh, if you listen to this, we like you too. We're not uh, insane, crazed socialists, if that's what you think. Of, or what other things might he think are crazy? Is, it, is the theology too hardcore around Jay's analysis? Is it too philosophic around here? This guy is nuts. I like him. Bro, you must be new, original sinner. You must be new, man. You must be welcome to the nerd party. Uh, last stream, we had 30,000 celebration, 30,000 nerds. Culturally enriched microbrews are dog crap. Yeah, my uh, my ex's dad used to make microbrew beers. They weren't that great. They weren't terrible, but... Everybody thinks they're going to microbrew and make make awesome beer. Uh, one of my friends actually did start a business. He turned his microbrewing into a profitable business. I will give him credit, but he basically had to like devote his entire life to freaking beer for 10 years and working 80 hours a week. Dude. You should start a YouTube channel and write books about movies. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he's, maybe, I think he does good with it. I don't know. Uh, thank you for those super chats there. Uh, I think I forgot the names. Brett, $5, is an Boomer fan. Uh, Happy New Year's to you, Brett. Evan Schultz, $20.19, 2019. It is going to be a good year. Somebody said, is 2019 going to be a good year? Yes, it is. Uh, 30000 yeah, I mean, come on, though. We all know. We all know that uh, the real count is a lot more than 30,000 here. We all know that. Come on. We know We know that. Come on. I'll trust some numbers. Some hater said that all my numbers are fake. Yeah, right, dude. They're fake in the sense that they're throttled. Grand Moff Tarkin. Grand Moff Alexander. Unrelated question, why does Stanley Kubrick use the song Surfing Bird during Full Metal Jacket? Thanks for the content. That's a great question. I just watched Full Metal Jacket not too long ago, and I was struck by all the Disney references. I think Kubrick put all that in there for sure. There's Mickey Mouses everywhere. Mickey Mices everywhere. Uh, Disney crap pops up all through Full Metal Jacket. Um, it relates to mind control, of course, because... And I do include, there is a little Kubrick in the new book. We had so much Kubrick in the first one, I didn't put a whole lot of Kubrick in part two. But we did do Clockwork Orange here. Uh, but Full Metal Jacket almost made it in because of Phoenix Program, Mind Control, that kind of stuff, right? Ooh, New England Publishing, $5. Owen and Jay do a weekly co-stream. I thought I think it'd be fun. I mean, I can't get, I can't get comedians to, to talk to me. They're too good for me. Talk to Sam Hyde in uh, private chat, yeah, but he's says he won't do interviews, which he actually doesn't really do interviews. Like he'll pop in for a few minutes, but but I can't get no clowns to clown around. Uh, now Benny, if you didn't see Benny Wills, great guy. We did a podcast. I thought that was fun. I think Benny Wills and I could do good. Joy Camp. Um, we'll probably try to do some more streams with Benny Wills. Uh, Owen, I'd like to, to do a chat with Owen. I don't know. It's all the, the door is always open if he wants to do it. Um, maybe he's scared of Orthodox theology. Maybe I, maybe I run people away with too much of the philosophic theology. I don't know. $5 John Valdez, Juan Valdez. Thank you. Happy New Year's to you, Juan Valdez. Much appreciated. You guys are great. Uh, we had a little bit of a uh, layover there with me being out of out of uh, Boomertown in the middle of disgusting weather, Tennessee. But I'm back to Boomertown where I can stream regularly. And and because I started realizing that we never know 
when streaming will go away. I mean, I don't anticipate it going away in the next week or anything, but I'm saying like, you know, we never know when the platform and st streaming will not be there for us. So I started thinking I sh ought to do more streaming while I have it, right? Um, get Eddie Bravo. Could be. I don't know about, uh, I never talked to Eddie Bravo. Um, Sam Tripoli might help me out on that. I don't know. I know that, uh, you know, him and uh, Eddie Bravo are friends, but I haven't really talked to Eddie Bravo. And I like that Owen has been talking about NASA and he's been talking about Darwin and how goofy Darwinism is and silly once you look at it. Uh, Eddie is the key to Joe Rogan. I guess he is, yeah. Sam, I'm sure, yeah, Sam would eventually come on. He's always doing his show, though, so I don't know, but... Um, there was somebody we were, I was going to have on. Who was it I was talking to to come on? We'll have one with Benny. If you didn't hear the Benny chat, that was funny. I thought it was funny. He cut some of my jokes out because they were pretty crude, and I realized afterwards I shouldn't have said that. So I'm actually glad that he cut out some of my... Uh, not crude in the sense of, like, completely filthy, but, like, uh, Rodney Dangerfield-style crude, like... You know, insult type jokes. Oh, I'm gonna respect to tell you. Oh. So you do, you get a little. There's a little free Rodney there. The first time I ever went to a comedy club, it was Dangerfields in New York, and there was a Cuban guy. It was like he acted like a Cuban mobster sitting behind me. And he didn't laugh the whole time. He just cussed. Like he just sat right behind me. The comedians weren't that funny anyway, but it was like amateur night or something. But it was just some Cuban guy just sitting back there going. Fucking a, fucking, fucking, fucking. <laughs> I was like, what? Did you just come out to cuss? Did you not want to come to the comedy club? Like, what? <laughs> Literally, that's all he said. It was just fucking, fucking, fucking. Anyway, so we're going to talk about the book. I'm talking about nonsense for a long time. And I want to talk a little, I want to talk about different stuff than what was coming up in other interviews because. I don't want to bore people with the same old crap every time. Um, so there's a lot of new material in this book. Uh, I'm very happy with how it turned out. Uh, there's quite a few typos still. Yes, I'm aware. Thank you, all of you intrepid copy uh, editors out there who are letting me know about the typos. Um, and since certain people called my, my entire work garbage, I decided it would be funny to actually quote a big fat paragraph of the guy who called all my work garbage right at the beginning of the book. So that now if he ever calls my work garbage, it actually means his work too is garbage. <laughs> so yeah, we dumb rednecks can be clever at times. Can't we? So yeah, I talked about, let's see, what do I talk about in this book? Well, I wanted to talk more about LSD and drugs. So I talked about Cary Grant had access to LSD before any of the hate Ashbury hippie idiots did. Did you know that? And even a little bit before the Laurel Canyon scene. And if you read Wim Hof's book, you know that John Courtney Murray, the famous Jesuit, was giving LSD to Hollywood people and people in his circles before 60s counterculture too. Jesuits on acid, man. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, I'm seeing into the Jesuit world, man. Oh, man. Uh, I don't know what I, 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 th I thought I had something funny with that. I was going to think about tripping Jesuits, but. Actually, that's not really that funny. That's kind of creepy because it's true. I'm not going to get on the acid tripping Jesuit comedy route. That's too. But anyway, so we talked about Sandow's pharmaceuticals. That's of course comes up in Jay Stevens's book. Uh, I didn't quote Jay Stevens. I should have put. I should have quoted Jay Stevens there, but it's in there. It's in Storming Heaven. And then I talked about propaganda in film. Re some of that but I wanted to note for all of you no 
For all of you Jordan fans out there, did you know the postmodernists and the deconstructionists worked for the CIA? They weren't Marxists. They weren't KGB, Soviet. Guess what? Francis Stoner Saunders wrote a whole book called Cultural Cold War. Did you know? No? E? Yes? Yes? Not no, but yes. E? A? In Francis Stoner Saunders' book, she talks about the French theorists. There's also professors, not just myself, Professor Peterson, but other professors who talk about the same thing. Deconstructionists, the postmodernists, were paid by the CIA. Common knowledge. They weren't Soviets. Bill Gates, Oprah, David Rockefeller, they're all KGB. <laughs> Hey, Jay, has you seen the Yuri Buzminov lecture? Has you seen Yuri Buzminov lecture? Is talk about exposing KGB. <laughs> Bill Gates' opera is all KGB. <laughs> They're not KGB, goofus. <laughs> what are you talking about? It would take you like five minutes of Googling to figure out they're not KGB. The deconstructionists weren't Soviets. What are you talking about? And I proved that because I just go to mainline history, dude. <laughs> in my country, <laughs> in my country, Soviet CIA, same thing in your country. Only is Soviet bad guy. <laughs> I was in Hot Springs at the Mafia Museum back in, I don't know, some month earlier. <laughs> Last year, maybe, towards the end of the year. I can't remember. Jamie and I visited the Mafia Museum in Hot Springs, which you should do. It's actually entertaining. Uh, where was I going with this story? There was some reason. How did that tie to Soviets and KGB? KGB. How do tie with KGB? David Rockefeller meet with KGB. I just totally lost my mind. I went blank. Oh, Yakov Smirnov was playing live. I wanted to go see Yakov. He was playing live. Uh, I bet we, I was not going to be there the night that he was playing. Now here comes Veronica <laughs> uh, Goomba from... Mario Brothers. She sends three ninety nine and says, "Die or take your pills." I take my supplements. Excuse me. I take my Androplex. I take my Super Male Vitality. I take my Red Pill. I take my everything that Alex Jones sells. So, if you mean that by pills, yes. Uh, no, I just crack up when I hear all this goofiness about. And every day I get sent, have you seen KGB lecture, Yuri Bezminov? I saw it 10 years before you saw it. <laughs> I saw it a long time ago. Uh, anyway, but if you listen to the Tim Kelly talk, I'm not going to talk about the fake movie companies that were set up. And then granddaughter of Charlie Chaplin. That's what I was trying to think of. Kira Chaplin was president of one of these fake companies. Limelight Pictures, uh, which was a front for international ecstasy smuggling, allegedly, if I recall. And that's from Hollywood Reporter. Uh, so, Skullduggery doesn't end there. And then I talked about Douglas Thompson, who has a pretty good book on Hollywood uh, and the Mafia. Dark History of Hollywood. I always get the Hollywood books mixed up because they all have similar titles except for esoteric Hollywood. And then we talked about uh, Mad Dog Mel Gibson and Lethal Weapon and how his character in Lethal Weapon is said in the text to be, in, in the screenplay, to be a member of the Phoenix Program, which is, again, Douglas Valentine's work. So I wanted to incorporate all that kind of stuff because that's perfectly in line with esoteric Hollywood. These are all aspects of esoteric Hollywood that most people don't know about. And 
so that introduction there sets the stage for the new book. And I think the writing is good. Uh, writing is better this time around. 235 nerds, welcome. All the Chad nerds. Uh, yeah. So Aviator, Chapter One. And we, you know, we pick out these figures that are that are emblematic of connecting the worlds of intelligence, or the worlds of finance, or the worlds of the occult and Hollywood. And there are a lot of interesting figures who kind of, you know, have their feet in multiple worlds. And Howard Hughes is one of the best examples of that early on. And so I went back and watched Martin Scorsese's Aviator. Really good stuff. Found some great quotes by Kissinger about Project Azorian, which he has worked on with the intelligence deep state of his time, uh, which is literally like a Blofeld style plot of trying to create a giant submarine swallowing boat. <laughs> uh, then we talked about. The Godfather. And I won't rehearse the Godfather section because Tim Kelly and I talked about The Godfather a long time ago. Grace Asher 199, don't call me out of don't call me out of my name. I'm a dork. Don't call you out by name or don't call you out of your name. Don't call out your name. I don't know. I'm confused. But thank you, Grace, for your super chat there. Much appreciated. And again, I'm, I'm thinking about trying to do a daily stream. I think that would be fun. And YouTube favors the, the longer stuff. Uh, by the way, so the reviews have already come in. There's one review on Amazon so far. Five stars. Five stars. There's a few reviews on Goodreads. Five stars. Five stars. Uh, anyway, so... Okay, Brett, again, $5. Thank you again, Brett. Thanks, dude. Keep what we do. Congrats on the new book. Much love. Well, much love to you, Brett. Very appre very much appreciated. My autism is kicking in, and I'm going into a crazy mode. Um, can't talk today. I got out of, out of practice of live streaming. Anyway, Godfather. You know we've talked about Godfather. Uh, the Tim Kelly Godfather interviews had 30, 40,000 views total from his to mine. So we're not going to rehash that, but I wanted to tie it into also Vatican stuff because Vatican stuff does tie into um, Hollywood because during the Cold War, uh, you have movies like The Miracle of Our Lady of Fatima and movies like The Prisoner where, as Wim Hof writes in his book, the Catholic Church be begins to be used for the purpose of Americanism and the promotion of Americanism, and that's a big part of why Vatican II went down and all the skullduggery uh, of, you know, the Vatican Bank and David Yollop's book and all that, all that uh, skullduggery. And I talk about how absurd it is, once again, to pin this all on a KGB conspiracy. And you would think, yeah, so what? So what? Well, here we are, what, 50, 60 years after the 50s and 60s, 70 years and we're still being told that the Russians are running everything and hijacking everything. So, again, all the more relevant. Uh, and then I transition. I didn't realize that my transitions were really good this time, but they are. I transitioned from that to Lawrence of Arabia and the history of Hollywood terror dialectics. And this comes from reading Wahlberg's book, Dreyfus's book, Curtis's book. Many, many, many geopolitical books, uh, Quigley, uh, on and on and on about the 20th century and geopolitical machinations. Ingdahl's books, all books we promote here at Jay's Analysis, all old talks that I've done in the archives. Be sure and watch those if you haven't seen them or listen to them. I think back then I was just doing, just doing videos. I mean, audios, I wasn't really doing videos yet. I was not sophisticated in my boomer tech. Now I am a sophisticated boomer tech individual. And I talk about Iron Man. I talk about the Ben Kingsley character is so obviously Iron Man and a 
Terror puppet. Terror puppet. Weapons of mass destruction and mustard gases. Weapons of mass destruction and mustard gases. And I talk about 007. Hanging out with the Mujahideen in 1987 in The Living Daylights. Which is, has a terrible song. The song for Living Daylights is awful. And yes, people pointed out Rambo too. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm not actually... Can you believe I've never seen Rambo? I don't know why. I just... I never was interested in Rambo. Uh, it just never seemed that good. I don't know. I will. I give you my word, though. We'll do Rambo. And I'll do... I don't know. We'll do it. I don't know. We'll do some... St- I don't know. I don't know. We'll do some streams on it. I don't know. I don't know. We'll do some streams on it. Or something. I don't know. I don't know. We'll do a stream on Rambo. I don't know. Ramboomer. <laughs> Ramboomer. <laughs> Ramboomer. <laughs> Robert Perry, journalist who just recently passed away. Consortium News, I think Patrick Henningsen has interviewed him. Uh, we look at some analyses from Robert Perry. We talk about Gary Webb. We talk about Kill the Messenger a little bit, not in depth. And we talk about mass media. And I talk about Saddam being a tool of the CIA, trained Miles Copeland. Miles My- Copeland. I cannot talk today. Miles Copeland discusses it in Game of Nations. Why have you not watched my Game of Nations video? The video has like 6,000 views. Everybody should have watched. This is a high-level CIA operative telling you how the Game of Nations in the real world works. Why have you not all watched my Game of Nations video? What are you doing? Don't ever critique me or come against me or come at me, bro, if you haven't watched that video. Come at me, bro. And then I talk about Geraldo, Geraldopium, remember when Geraldo went and interviewed the troops guarding the opium? (laughs) And remember when the opium production increased 70% after Afghanistan? So I talked about that stuff, right? Then I talked about Clue, the movie, because I wanted to throw some crazy movies in. And I threw crazy movies in part one. Everybody loved that. Throw the crazy ones in. Let us tell us about Labyrinth. Tell us about David Bowie. Tell us about David Bowie and Labyrinth. Sarah, Sarah, look into my eyes, Sarah. Look into my creepy eyes. I'm an ODO black star, a cultist, Sarah. Sarah, my name is David Bowie. <laughs> I talked, and everybody loved that Labyrinth was in the book. Well, guess what? I include goofy movies and the new one too. Now you might not know about it, but Clue is about Hollywood Cold War dialectics. And if you haven't seen Clue, go back and watch it and you will see that I am 100% right. And nobody else noticed this except Jay's analysis. That's why we have the best movie analyses out there. Vigilant Citizen, get out of here, dude. How many times can you write an MK Ultra mind control Illuminati analysis of a movie, bro? How many times? Can, well, apparently you can do it every single time because that's the only thing any movie is about. Uh, so that's why the Jay's analysis movie reviews are way better. And I was doing it before Vigilant Citizen was anyway. Vigilant Citizen, get that out of here. I get messages and people are like, have you seen... Like, hey man, have you like seen Vigilant Citizen? Have you seen? Have you heard of Vigilant Citizen? Have you heard of Yuri Bazmanov? <laughs> anyway, I liked Hail Caesar's presentation of Hollywood Cold War. That's what I think. That's a little more accurate. And then, what do we close that chapter with? Wim Hof. Whoa! And then I talked about Point Break. Whoa! Whoa, whoa. Because Point Break is about the FBI infiltrating surfer terrorist groups. <laughs> and so it actually reveals how silly surfer anti terror 
the surfer Nazis, if you remember, Anthony Kiedis is a surf Nazi, and his group gets broken up by Keanu. And then Patrick Swayze is leading the Zen Buddhist anarcho terror group that are surfers. Because every niche group has surfers or has terrorists in it, whether it's surfers or gamers. There's terrorists or there's terrorists everywhere. Musher gashes. <laughs> and so, yes, we talk about. He's like the wind between my cheeks. I feel his breath on my face. His body close to me. <laughs> Can't look in his eyes. Patrick Swayze's all I see. Just a fool to believe I have anything Swayze needs. <laughs> He's like the wind. People are like, this guy's lost his mind. Bro, we've been crazy the entire time, dude. What are you talking about? We've been crazy the entire time. Patrick Swayze, yep. This is literally making me laugh out loud. WTF. What? What? WHTF? What held the F? That's because you're not, you don't understand the beauty of Patrick Swayze when he's dirty dancing and when he was... <laughs> Isn't he like a classically trained? He was like a ballerina, dude. <laughs> I'm making jokes, bro. Making jokes, bro. Do you even ballerina, bro? Do you even ballerina, bro? And the funniest thing in the world is when Patrick Swayze's nostrils flare up. They go crazy, dude. They're like a, they go nuclear. And so I even had to put funny. I put a lot of funny stuff in this book, right? Like Patrick Swayze nostril flares when he cries in Red Dawn. And yes, we talk about Red Dawn because Red Dawn is hilarious Hollywood Cold War nonsense. The commies, the commies are going to invade from Mexico and Canada. <laughs> but the Wolf Pack, Charlie Sheen, and the Wolf Pack are going to save us. There's even a nod to everything is terrible in my book. You say, what? Well, there was a hidden nod in Esoteric Hollywood 1 to Mystery Science Theater. I bet, I bet not many of you caught my hidden nod to Mystery Science Theater. And this time around, there's a hidden nod to Everything is Terrible with Bulletproof and Butthorn. Gary Busey is Butthorn. <laughs> By the way, there uh, the surf terrorists talk about the Federal Reserve in Point Break. Did you know that? Did you know the, the surf terrorists who are the ex-presidents? talk about the federal reserve so if you talk about the federal reserve you must be a, a member of Bodhi's zen surf terror sect and then we move to v for vendetta i should oh man i should have put my i'm sorry i should have put my v for vendetta mask on and done a another idiotic improv like v does uh, but I'm very happy with my idiotic V improv. If you watch the Cage stream, is it Cage? I think it's the Nick Cage stream. Uh, no, sorry, the National Treasure Cage stream, not the recent Cage stream. The the National Treasure Cage stream, uh, where Nick saves America. I believe the beginning of that one. I have my V mask on, and I I got that. Just because I, I think those things are so stupid. Guy Fox masks. Anyway, but uh, did you know that, that he tells Evie, uh, basically he initi initiates her into Satanism. Did you know that? She shaves her head like Britney Spears. Hey, Britney. So I talk about managed dialectics. I even talk about Spangler. Oswald Spankler. There is no proletariat nor a communist movement that is not operated in, in the interests of money and in the for a time being permitted by money. And without these idealists amongst its leaders, 
having the slightest suspicion of that fact. So there's Spangler making fun of communism as a tool of the bankers. Exactly. Who can't figure that out? A lot of people can't figure that out. I talked about the Masonic De Declaration of Human Rights. And I'd, what is this I'm citing? Something to do with... Oh, I cite uh, the great Jay Dyer. <laughs> uh, quite a few citations of Jay's analysis, if you're not familiar with it. Ha, ha, ha. You pompous ass. Uh, about the Hermetica and Egyptian dialectics then. Anarchism. Anarchism as a tool of dialectical tension. So it's not just the capitalists and the communists. Don't forget, the anarchists are also part of the theatrical stage play. Because all the isms are nonsense. Actually, I think this. I think this chapter is really good. I mean, the the V for Vendetta anarchism dialectics chapter. I mean, this is some. This stuff's gold, dude. And then I kind of transition into talking about philosophy, the code of nature, dialectics coming out of natural principles, and then I move of course, into Buckaroo Bonsai. And Jeff Goldblum, who I think plays a gay guy. I can't really tell what his character is, but anything with Jeff Goldblum is is good, right? Of course it is. When I start, is, is it just impressions? Is that what gets me the paychecks? Is that what you guys want? Just impressions? All right, let's see. I got to do my, how do I do? I did my Jeff Goldblum. I got to bring it back to memory. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. The, 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 the boomer source, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the boom, boomer source Rex, uh, 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 the, 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 the boomer source Rex, uh, has, has a, has a, uh, a distinctive, uh, uh, 401k, uh, the, the 401k, uh, of the, of the boomer source Rex, uh, is, uh, is just something, something, uh, uh, has to be preserved preserved in uh, a giant park where we we clone boomers i don't know is that any good i feel like that sounds like jeff goldblum doesn't it better work on that one it was really good back when i was doing it with with uh with john uh jeff jeff uh the jeff goldblum goldblum uh, impersonation now now the 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 boomer uh, the boomer can can uh, swat me swat me with his with his fly swatter. Uh, that's because I uh, brundle fly brundle. Uh, I I become a a fly. It's not Jeff Goldblum. Well, shit, man. Let me hear it, Jeff Goldblum talk, and I'll get it right. Some people are saying it's really good. Every I think of Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park. You know, when he's freaking out talking about uh, the dinosaurs or whatever, all that nonsense. So it needs to be 90s Jeff Goldblum. All my impersonations are the people from the 90s, except maybe Nick Cage, because sometimes the Nick Cage is uh, modern day Nick Cage, which is a little more relaxed. Okay, here's a newer Goldblum. Let's hear him talk. Jeff Goldblum is hilarious. Let's see if he is. Handsome, like you have a six pack. Oh, you're handsome. Uh, you can tell by looking at my uh, head area that I don't have the, the, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the. You are handsome in your head area. No, you are talking like someone from another planet. Pardon my phraseology. Pardon my, uh, my, my, uh, phraseology. My, my, uh. Yeah, yeah, we, we had so much fun uh, here, here. My, uh, this, uh, this is my, uh, my, my, uh, my home, uh, uh, my, my, my home base, uh, where, where we, we, uh, we clone dinosaurs and, uh, and flies. Yes, we, we clone the dinosaurs and the, the flies. Colonial style, I believe. Colonial, colonial style. Oh, I didn't even know outside here. I can this play room. piano. This orange grove. Well, this, this, this orange grove. Yeah, dude, that's that sounds like him. Get out of here, haters. That sounds that sounds just like Jeff Goldblum, brah. I like Lord of War.
Yeah, I do do a great Cobra Commander. Come on now. Okay, so yeah, people are liking it. It's getting better. Another, thank you, Brett, again, $2. So is that what it, you just pay me the money and I do the impressions, right? Um, I'll do Cobra Commander uh, talking to Jordan Peterson in a conversation if I get some more Super Chats. Does that sound fun? Does that sound fun? Well, I'll do that if we get that. But yeah, Buckaroo Bonsai, man, that's a that's a fun movie. Basically, the David I David Ike, the Cheetah Ure worldview of David Ike is the plot of Buckaroo Bonsai. But they've got some weird parallels with Back to the Future. I'm going to create basically a DeLorean that doesn't travel in time, but it travels through matter. I uh, kind of like. But it, but it needed to be in there. And then I talked about The Prisoner. Yeah. Great show. Everybody should watch The Prisoner. You could figure out a lot of uh, geopolitical subterfuge if you just watched the 17 episodes of The Prisoner. Uh, the Prisoner tells you everything. Just watch The Prisoner. Great show. And then we get into The Ninth Gate, which is... Curiously parallel to Eyes Wide Shut, is it not? Well, yes, it is. And I go through the imagery in The Ninth Gate that is from the tarot, right? It, it, you see Phil, the Corso character basically going down this uh, path of initiation. Again, one of the many Hollywood films where we literally are seeing people going through a process of initiation, right? This is what Eyes Wide Shut's about, in my view. This is what 2001's about, in Jay Widener's view. Uh, so I go into the, the tarot, the tarot cards, and the symbolism in Polanski's Ninth Gate. What the, what's going on here? Again, Rosemary's Baby, Ninth Gate. Come on. We know what this is about. And then, you know, we see, we see the similarities between, look at the similarities between Eyes Wide Shut and Ninth Gate. Same ritual, same standing at the gate. And I argue Ninth Gate is also a, a version of Dante's right Inferno, right? the descent, et cetera, into Inferno. And then we do my Twin Peaks. And I was right about everything I wrote in my initial analysis of Twin Peaks because Mark Frost's book backed, it, it confirmed everything I said. Maybe Mark Frost even read my analysis. Because I wrote the best analysis of Twin Peaks ever. And by golly, I was right. And Lucy, Lucy from Twin Peaks, read my analysis, and she liked it. Lucy Moran. That means I get the David Lynch thumbs up of approval. Way to go, Dyer. Two bucks on Jordan Cobra. Okay. Mm, uh, if I get a little bit more, okay. So we got five from New England. Maybe save the impression for later tonight on the uh, NYE. No, New Year's Eve. I was like New York, New York Eastern Street, New York, NYE. But I like to see <laughs> Jeff Goldblum and Jordan Peterson discuss chaos theory. <clears throat> Every time I do Cobra, it wrecks my vocal cords. Yes, Cobra. Ignorant leaders, you're. <coughs> <coughs> I told you. <coughs> it's like if you try to sing Oasis songs, if you sing like Liam Gallagher, it makes your voice. <coughs> you start coughing. <coughs> Ignorant Jordan Peterson followers, Cobra Commander is the real snake. Well, I don't know. What's the snake mean? What's the symbolism of the snake? Sounds phallic to me. You know, symbolic. It's phallic. It's phallic. Yes, of course it's phallic. You fool. Cobra is the commander of the phallus. Well, I think I think Carl Young and Carl Young talked about the phallus. I think he talked about it perfectly. I think he talked about it in an extended fashion. <laughs> of course he talked about it, you fool. Cobra Commander is the ultimate phallus. <coughs> All right. My voice is just... <coughs> My throat, that hurts your throat to do Cobra Commander, dude. (sighs) 
But I like the idea of Jeff Goldblum and Jordan Peterson debating chaos theory. <laughs> and then <laughs> what would Cobra Commander say to them too? That would be funny. We should, I should start doing streams of just voices of people interacting, which is kind of what we used to do when we would do the, uh, the joke streams. We would do, or not streams, but the clips. There's a clip of me and John and Chris doing, um, it's Alex Jones' show calling Nick Cage and Jeff Goldblum and uh, Charlie Sheen, I think. Anyway, we did a few of those. They're, they're really funny. But that would be fun to do, just, just have these weird conversations of you guys tell me, like throw it out there like improv, you know, like do Jordan Peterson arguing with Jeff Goldblum and Alex Jones uh, over, you know, whatever, cover commander, whatever, I don't know. And then throw in David Bowie in there, David Lynch. Anyway, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I really liked season three of Twin Peaks. I don't know why anybody wouldn't like it, especially when you dive into the Jiao Day, the meaning of Jiao Day in the series, which is spoken of as... Uh, a demonic entity that's concerned with bringing about the Antichrist, the end of time. Uh, Judy, Jiao Day, that's the key to understanding season three. Of course, nobody got this, and that's why they were all like, what does season three mean? I hate it. <sighs> then I talk about Back to the Future. Descent into the unconscious archetypes. Very Peterson. Peterson-esque, Petersonian, Peterson-esque. Peterson sounds phallic. And then I discuss Ghostbusters. And there's more going on in Ghostbusters than you would think. And then I discuss Poltergeist. And then I discuss Stranger Things. And there wasn't really a whole lot in Stranger Things season two. There was a little bit more of the MK Ultra stuff, but you know, season one was so blatant about it that it's you know how do you leave that out? So this is again in the uh, MK Ultra section where I investigate MK Ultra in film. Uh, I included my psyche and noose discussion there, the split that can occur, um, and how spiritual healing basically involves the reintegration of the person, uh, the, the mind and heart working together in through repentance, right? That's why you can't just have an intellectual approach to, uh, to Christianity or to the faith or whatever. It has to be a renovation of the whole person, body, soul, and spirit. Uh, we discussed Clockwork Orange. Didn't want to have, didn't want to have no Kubrick in there. And I think my, my Clockwork Orange analysis came out pretty good. I, I wrote a Clockwork Orange analysis a long time ago, uh, and it was really crappy. And so I think uh, like a year or two ago, I said, I'm going to redo redo that. And I thought it was pretty good. Um, they Live. Can't do Esoteric Hollywood. I got criticisms like uh, the first time around. Why is there no uh, John Carpenter? Where's your They Live? Well, you'll notice in the last year or two we've done quite a bit of john carpenter haven't we i think we've covered we did the apocalypse trilogy we did escape from new york we did they live all fun stuff i think my they live analysis is really good came out great i'm, I'm pretty proud of all these lost boys we can't forget lost boys michael 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 and the, yeah, Creeper Pedo stuff going on in the background of that movie. Right? Kids being kidnapped, taken. That's what's going on in that movie. Come on. It's obvious. Oh, yeah. Can you do the Macho Man Randy Savage? Oh, yeah. <coughs> <coughs> See? <coughs> Jordan Cobra. That would be a crazy one. But there's your... Randy Savage, Larry Rydell, which, again, Cobra Commander and the Macho Man really destroy your throat. Not in a dirty way. 
American Ultra, uh, again, a such a self consciously MK Ultra based movie that I couldn't leave that out. Uh, I thought it was pretty good, actually. I mean, I know it's an establishment film, uh, but I, I tried to throw in, you know, some new quotes from people that deal with MK Ultra that you don't expect, like Huxley talking to. Uh, it's Huxley's letter to Orwell, actually. So I, I discussed that there. Alters, splits, right? We know about this. This is in so many movies. And one of the best for mind control trauma in this is The Cell, right? Stephen King's story. The J-Lo Vince Vaughn movie, remember? Remember that? Go back and watch that. Um there's more going on there than you think. Because when it came out, it was kind of like, yeah, this is visually interesting, but so what? This is dumb. But again, a lot of the, these films, back when people were watching these films in the 90s, uh, you know, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, a lot of us weren't aware of all the MK Ultra stuff and how real it was. So when we watched these movies, we'd be like, yeah, it was kind of dumb. Who cares? That was silly. And then you go back and you watch a lot of these goofy movies, and you're like, man, that was actually talking about some real stuff going on there <sighs> neon demon i mean that one had to be in there just because of all the hollywood stuff and you know i meant to have stuff about the nexium cult uh but the book was the, the the manuscript was due you know right around the time that all the, the nexium stuff was kind of in hot in the news so i didn't really have time to, to stick nexium stuff in Esoteric Hollywood, too. And you know what? I like David Lynch's Dune. Everybody hates that movie. I think it's great. David Lynch hates it. That movie. I like it. Uh, Jay, you ever need an animator? I've got some fun ideas. Thank you, John Gorris. I appreciate that. Uh, actually, I have quite a few animators who reach out to me. Um, I actually had four or five in the last year that reach out. Um, and I'll definitely keep it in mind, all you guys, uh, all you animators who've reached out are, are top-notch guys. Um I just haven't really had a place for animation yet. Maybe in the next book, you know, there'll, there'll be a need for that. Dune. Dune is fun. Uh, Paul Atreides versus the feminist witch cult. That's that's why Dune is good. And weather craziness. Weather mod. That kind of stuff. And then Avengers. And then weather. So Snowpiercer fits into that. And I talked about Platonism and Snowpiercer and weather modification and stuff. Because again, why is Hollywood showing us all this? Well, come to Jay's analysis and I'll tell you. That's why. Alien, Alien series. That's that's the Hollywood decoded that got cut it that got cut. Cutted. That got cutted. <laughs> Oh, man. I wish I hadn't got cut. I want to see the alien Hollywood decoded, and I want to see the Rosemary's Baby Hollywood decoded, and the Mulholland Drive and Lost Highway Hollywood decoded that got cut. I want those back, dog. I want to see those. Signs. Signs. Somebody, one of those goofy evangelical sites, like, I don't know, or one of those neocon sites, American thinker that's I don't know that's that's not a goofy I don't think they're neocon American conservative pathos I don't know one of those kind of sites they did a stupid signs analysis and it got like half a million shares something crazy like that and if I write you know on signs I can get 500 shares so I think my analysis of, of signs is correct so then we move to talking about NGOs, feminism, transhumanism, and the whole history of revolutions and revolutionary movements. And I talk about proto-matrix analyses, like Tron. If you go back and watch Tron, it talks about DARPA, pretty crazy stuff in Tron you don't expect. And then I'm like, you know what? This is a lot like the Matrix. Well, yeah, it is. So then I give a more fuller presentation of my matrix analyses and the matrix trilogy. And we tied in the symbolism. We tied in the esotericism, the numerology, the Kabbalism, 
the predictive programming in the matrix very well. And in fact, in case you don't know, uh, two years ago, three years ago, that my matrix analysis went mega viral. In fact, it was for a time like one of the top shared posts, period. It was going mega viral. Uh, and it was on all kinds of sites across the world. Um, and I, it got mirrored on all these sites. Uh, and it was pretty awesome. I could, I eventually lost track of how many shares it had. And it was even being put on weird sites like disinfo.com and, you know, that publishing company. And um, I don't think it was on Vice, but uh, some girl from Vice basically rewrote my Lost Boys analysis. Good job there, bro. Uh, she did at least give me credit, though. But so. So let's talk about Matrix since I titled this stream matrix, right? We got to, I guess we need to talk about it. I'm not going to give away everything, but cause I did bring in some more material with matrix two and matrix three, uh, which matrix series is like, uh, right. It goes down. And we did the matrix by the way, PewDiePie, <clears throat> I don't know if PewDiePie has seen Jay's analysis, but I wonder if he has. I wonder. I don't know. PewDiePie, have me have me on your videos or something, dude. You could like, you could like make me, bro. Because if PewDiePie has seen Jay's, and here's let me tell you why. Because we know he watches certain streams I've been on. We know that because he's talked about those streams more than once. And PewDiePie did a Matrix video. That is exactly like the Hollywood Decoded episode of The Matrix. I mean, exactly like it. It's the same images. It's the same like cartoon, goofy drawings that Gaia used for the episode. <laughs> so I think PewDiePie has seen that episode. And I'm not, I'm not dissing PewDiePie. I don't care. I, I think his uh, analysis was great. But, dude, give a shout out, bro. You could like, you can make me into a a YouTube zillionaire, a YouTube megastar. PewDiePie is a, a kingmaker. I'm joking. Uh, I guess he could be, though, if he was a, uh, if he was to shout out Jay's analysis, that'd be pretty awesome. So PewDiePie, if you watch Jay's analysis, hook us up, dog. Um, so what are we going to say about the Matrix? Well, the Matrix is a platonic gnostic kabbalistic view of the world so in ways it's insightful but it's also off in a lot of ways because it also as we know tries to tie in like far eastern weird elements that don't really make sense if we are imprisoned in a gnostic archon simulation but the matrix also in many ways prepped us for the acceptance of the internet it was predictive programming in a lot of ways, uh, living in, immersing ourselves in the virtual. Here we are doing live streams, right? Um, and the matrix, it's, it, it's impossible to calculate how much the matrix influenced pop culture in that, in that regard. So it, it is at once revelation of the method and predictive programming and conditioning at the same time. And everybody knows, oh, yeah, well, it was a revolutionary um, technology and, and cinematography uh, effects at the time and all that. Yeah, we all know that. Uh, and I think it was the Paul Debevac guy. He went on to work with the Pentagon. I think that's right. Um, I've talked about him on many podcasts and streams. But one thing I noticed that nobody else has talked about, which is that when we first see Neo in the apartment, Neo, what's on Neo's computer screen is they present Morpheus as a terrorist. And he's sought by British intelligence. So I wonder if we're supposed to think that we're supposed to link terror with revolutionary philosophies, worldviews, right? 
uh, and ha <coughs> hacking, you know, hacking was everywhere in the nineties. I did a stream where we talked about, uh, hackers, right. With Angelina Jolie and, um, I forget the blonde guy and Matthew Lillard. Um, but there was all these hacking movies and remember Johnny Mnemonic, right? These kind of, this kind of stuff. Um, Ghost in the Machine. There's a whole bunch of these crappy hacker movies in the late 90s. And Matrix actually is part of this, right? But it's like the old, it's the penultimate hacker movie, right? Get your Hot Pockets ready. Uh, ding, ding, ding. Microwave Hot Pockets are ready. Get your Surge Cola. Remember your Surge Cola? Because we're going to start hacking, bro. We're going to motherboard the Pentagon tonight, bro. Uh, get your floppy disks ready. But... I talk about a lot of the names that are used, Zion, Nebuchadnezzar, Heart of the City, uh, the numerology that's all through the Matrix. We, I talk about uh, Manly P. Hall, the way he discusses numerology, alchemy. Um, managed dialectics, obviously, that's a no-brainer here. Neo is listening to massive attacks, massive attack on his headphones. That's interesting. I had forgotten that. The lyrics are when he's listening, feels like I've done this before. Well, that makes sense. Because Neo is like a recurring hero avatar, right? He come this is like the I forget what, what incarnation Keanu is in the presentation we're watching. Uh, and then we have the references to Baudrillard on nihilism from his uh, philosophic works Simulacra and Simulation. This is what Neo references. PewDiePie mentioned this in his video. Uh, and by the way, I knew this was before Mark Pazio did his matrix analysis. I, I knew all this stuff. Um, White Rabbit, Alice in Wonderland, mind control stuff comes up. Can't forget that. And of course, 9-11 being on Neo's passport. Isn't that interesting? How many times that pops up in film? Simulacra, simulation. You might say, well, PewDiePie just watched Mark Pazio's video. No, no, no. The, vi the imagery in PewDiePie's video is the same imagery in the Hollywood Decoded video. Plato's Cave, Allegory of the Cave. Can't forget that stuff. We know that. Um, Baudrillard talks about the simulation replacing reality and that that's what the virtual world is doing. Is like It's becoming the real world. And it's becoming more real than the real world. So there's this bizarre double think aspect to virtual worlds where they the simulacra uh, replaces the, uh, it replaces reality. The, 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 the simulation becomes the reality. But Philip K. Dick talked about this, right? Um, there's a lot of Masonic philosophy uh, and Far Eastern philosophy, dialectics, the checkered floorboard in the Matrix. Double-headed eagle in the Matrix, not to do with Byzantium, but to do with uh, Scottish Rite Masonry, right? Ordo ab Caio, Order out of Chaos. It's very, it's essentially a Gnostic Luciferian work. Basically, uh, the old man God character is a, he's the architect because he's the great architect. And somebody was arguing with me about. You said Aristotle called God the architect, and I can't find it. It's in his works, I assure you. I'm not making that up. I have a almost photographic memory for books, especially what I read. It was a lot better when I was younger in my 20s. It still works pretty good, but uh, I'm right about that. I don't have my Aristotle book here, collected works of Aristotle, but yes, I am right. He says God is an architect. And it was supposed to be Sean Connery, Sean Connery, Neo. Neo, I'm the architect. Sean Connery is the architect. Shaken, not stirred. I know that's dumb, but what else can you think of Sean Connery saying except shaken, not stirred? So if I think about trying to do Sean Connery's voice, what else does he say? <clears throat> that's the only thing you think of. Uh, he was supposed to be the architect, which is interesting because he always plays that kind of a role. If you watch The Man Who Would Be King, he plays that role in a Masonic movie. Openly Masonic movie. 
I was mentioned. I mentioned the man who would be king to a lot of people, and they're like, "What are you talking about? You haven't seen the man who would be king? This is like one of the most Masonic movies of all time." By the way, I'm not a Mason. I'm anti-Mason. Okay, but the man who would be king? Come on, that's like a super Masonic movie, and it shows you trickery. <clears throat> shows you trickery, dog. Watch the man who would be king. Evan Schultz, ten dollars. <clears throat> Found you a long, a long time ago. Can you comment on the retardation of all right paganism? Uh, yeah, the turn towards paganism. I think this is so silly. This is so silly. Uh, I mean, all I need to say is go watch my video on uh, not Genesis, Genesis versus Gnostics. Um, I think we talked about paganism and neo paganism in the stream with Roma's burning. That's what we meant to talk about. I think we talked about it. The Athanasius videos I did, I did two Athanasius videos, and one of them is on paganism against the heathens. Oh, the Irenaeus Gnosticism video, that applies to paganism too, because paganism just falls into the same stuff. Yeah, I can't believe people are so silly as to fall for this pagan crap, dude. This is being promoted by... <laughs> All the same people that promote all the other stuff. My Odin. My Odin. My Viking. I'm going to get a Viking beer hat and start wearing my Viking beer hat. But no, I don't. I mean, come on. Odinism. This is so retarded, dude. But you get played like a fiddle, dog. Everybody gets played like a fiddle into these idiot ideologies. Running Man, I thought it would be neat to include the Running Man because there's a lot of predictive programming in Running Man. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the other esoteric elements of the Matrix. You can go figure this out in the book. Terminator, couldn't pass up Terminator, especially having now, because I wrote the Terminator analysis a while back, and then now that I've read a lot of the Pentagon brain, a lot of the history of DARPA, you know, these big fat PHAT books. I'm on point, dog. I'm on point. I thought it would be good to include that. Her. Her is a relevant film. So I included her. Ex Machina, right? Again. <clears throat> Westworld, had to throw that one in there. Had to throw a fun B movie, uh, Cherry 2000. Great B movie. Because of the sex bots. They're coming. They're here. They're everywhere. Um, yeah, I mean, we're not going to talk paganism on this stream, but, but yeah. Thank you, Evan Schultz. But I will. <clears throat> I, I'm sure you saw those, the Genesis versus paganism stream, but <clears throat> uh, we're, there will be some more theology streams coming. We're going to do some more, some more theology streams. And then we close the book with Metropolis and Metropolis is so consciously, you know, I mean, look at this. Metropolis is Hora Babylon and AI. AI bots being created who in their right who will ever doubt predictive programming who will, who can ever call us crazy conspiracy theorists after you see AI bots being created under giant inverted pentagrams in a movie from 1927 come on come on we're right we're not crazy we're right so that's esoteric Hollywood too what do you guys think I mean I'm happy with it. Um, there's some things I would have liked to have been included. Um, but but that, I felt the same way with the first one. There was stuff that I wish was included that that just didn't fit. Uh, you know, if, if your book goes over 400 pages, it, it um, like the sales decrease because people don't want to read more than 400 pages. Um, but but you know, it's it's heavily cited. It's I think the footnotes this time were in the 300s. There's more content in this one, more pages, uh, and less footnotes. In the first one, there were less pages, more footnotes. So now that I've kind of established myself as reputable, I don't need as many footnotes. You know, you know what I'm saying is true. Come on, you know what I'm saying is true. <laughs> um, but no book like it. There's no book like this, and there's no book like the first one. And. It wakes people up, and 
the writing is better this this time around i think the prose is better this time around i think i think other people think that two almost 300 nerds tonight excellent we've gone for what an hour and 20 minutes so yeah esoteric hollywood dropping a deuce <laughs> on you <laughs> You can get those at the Jay's Analysis Shop. Signed copies. You'll see the buttons there. Sort by popular. Well, they're both popular. And if you uh, select the options there, it tells you that you can uh, get inside the U.S., outside the U.S. And if you buy it at the site, remember, you have to, if you use the way the payment things are set up, you kind of have to go back to the checkout. You'll figure it out. Everybody figures it out. It's a little confusing at first, but play around with it a little bit. It works. Just If you do it with PayPal, it makes you go back to proceed to cart. Go back to your cart. Then you have to proceed to checkout if you get it at the site. So the shop at Jay's Analysis. I think you guys will dig it. Great book. A lot of fun. Funny. People are saying this one's funny. Good. I like to think of myself as funny. Uh, a lot of people would disagree. No, they wouldn't. Not anymore. Everybody knows it's funny. Is Jamie ever coming back? What do you mean? Of course she's coming back. I just uh, spent three weeks with Jamie in Tennessee at my mama house. We was at my mama house. Uh, yeah, Jamie's books are still available too. If you want to read more, I helped Jamie with this one, actually. So Hollywood Mind Control is a great book you can get at Freeman TV. Still sold there. And uh, Jamie's, Jamie's books are more colorful, more interesting in the avenue of the aesthetic. It's more of a coffee table book. A lot of the same interesting material. But she talks about not just Hollywood, but also the pop stars, right? The Beyonce's and the, and the uh, Katy Perry's and all that stuff. Uh, never, but enlightening nevertheless. So, so that's what uh, I think the Matrix was was the, one of the more important analyses to have in the book. So that's why it's in part two. Uh, it didn't go into part one. I felt like I probably should have put it in part one, but then I was like, you know what? There's going to be a part two. So, so we can have the Goonies and the Matrix and Time Bandits and Poltergeist and all those eighties classics there together under the Hollywood mobs cult spies and the occult it's all it's all gold dude it's all gold 300 nerds tonight thank you guys so much uh, I'm sure there'll be some more shows be going on with KJ probably happy new year to you guys uh, I, I was thinking about doing a theology stream if I have enough energy tonight I may continue on and do philosophy theology stream tonight uh, i'm not really in a i just drove six seven hours again last night to get back home so i'm not really in a in a stay up until midnight mood i'm kind of tired today i don't know who, who's jonathan cleck i'm not I've never never heard of jonathan cleck don't know who that is jay you've woken me up so much well thank you joanne I'm like i'm glad you're enjoying the material at Stark Hollywood 2 at jaysanalysis.com. Correct. Uh, the description shows where you can get the book below. should be there if you want to get the book. Again, already sold out. The The, the new shipment should be arriving uh, tomorrow, I think. Tomorrow or the day after. So uh, all of the first batch went out in three days. They were gone in three days. Four days. Three, four days. Right before Christmas. Um a good portion of the next batch has already been sold, but there's plenty of time. Uh, so these will go like hotcakes and I'll get another, another batch. So, uh, I think, I don't know, but I think, uh, if you look at trying days catalog, uh, you know, Bilderberg group by Daniel Estelin and Hollywood decoded are like right up there. Like, I mean, Hollywood Decoded has not sold as good as Bilderberg Group. I'm not saying that. Bilderberg Group's been out for 15 years. I mean, something like that. So, a long way to go, but uh, I'm just saying it's, you know, it's there. It's good. Oh, 
man. All these fedora freaks that still comment on the videos. You talk about mind control on your channel. Uh, explain to me how it is you can choose a church and believe that you're not part of mind control. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Victoria Goomba from the Mario Brothers series. You asked a bunch of theology questions too, and I forgot I was going to reply to those. Uh, feel free to put those in the chat, Mrs. Goomba, if you're still listening or watching. Pagans don't believe their own stuff. Yeah, I mean, anyway. So, Esther Hollywood 2, sign copies of Jason Ellis. That's the advantage if you get a Jason analysis and not on Amazon. Uh, you know, they come signed. And I write funny little messages for you, specifically for you, if you request it. If you don't request it, I just sign it. But people ask, are the, are the ones from your website signed? Yes, they are all signed. All signed copies. And it says that in the product description. So... Uh, outside the U.S., $60. Inside the U.S., 30 That covers shipping. People always ask that question. Uh, for outside the U.S., they say, why is it so expensive? Well, because it costs about $25 to ship anywhere in the world. Uh, flat rate, pretty much. I think it's, uh, if you do it to Canada, it's like 22 or 3 And if you do it to like New Zealand, it's like 27 8 So uh, I, don't, I don't think I've ever mailed one to China, but it's probably expensive to China. I don't know, but... So that covers the shipping and handling. So I just decided to do a flat rate, make it just simple 60 or 30. But that is the advantage of getting it from me is that it is signed copy. And come on, a signed copy from me makes it all the more lovable. Anyway, so I don't see any more super chats. Uh, maybe we'll close this up. Just wanted to give a discussion of the book, what it's about, the new material, overview talk about elements that other interviews haven't talked about i'm sure in the next few weeks we'll be doing more interviews with other other shows and other podcasts and we'll talk we'll touch on other material um but you can also subscribe to jay's analysis for 4.95 a month or for 60 dollars a year all automated now subscription buttons there everything's working good um we just did uh postmodern imperialism was the last talk i think we did um, we're probably going to do some more philosophy and theology next. I like to rotate back and forth from the geopolitics to the philosophy to the theology. You know, it kind of makes it less monotonous when we do it that way. Still got to repair some of the archives. I noticed uh, some of the links are still uh, still broken, and I still need to move a lot of stuff into the archive to make it uh, for subscribers to make it a fuller experience. We want all of the old Hollywood. Uh, all the old esoteric Hollywood podcasts, I want them to be in the archive. So I'm going to move all those there too. Uh, they're going to stay, many of them public, but also having them in there too. Uh, because they used to be there. Thank you for your apologetics. Thank you. Yeah. We're definitely going to have more of that. Um, there was some, a lot of trad Catholics talking smack this week. And I invited a lot of them onto debate. And once you invite them on, oh, suddenly... Bro, it's just Bance, bro. It's just Bance, bro. You know, I, I talk about how, how how horrible you are and how easy it would be to refute you in a debate. And then when I get invite, invited on, uh, no, it's just Bance, bro. It's just Bance, bro. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and then there was an individual who was a set of a contest uh, that I thought about we were going to do a debate, but now he's not a set. He may not be a set of a contest anymore. And I'm like, oh. If you're not, if you haven't made your mind up on those those kinds of issues, you know, come on, how are you gonna go out and start debating people on, uh, you know, Eastern theology from a thousand years ago? If you're, I mean, it's just the, the Eastern material needs to be read first before we engage in the debate. Uh, if that happens, then maybe. But. Alan Watts. Alan Watts, the Buddhist guy? 
or hi folks i'm alan watt and you're listening to cutting through the matrix that alan watt i don't know which alan watt you're talking about uh well, i did an interview with um on 5g with the funny guys the funny canadian guys uh i just went blank The Buddhist dude. What? Come on, dude. You must be new to my channel. The Buddhist dude? Come on. Alan Watt? I, no. Come on, man. That has nothing to do with Jason Nelson. Um, Grimerica. I'm sorry. I, no offense to the... I, I like the Grimerica guys. I, was, I just couldn't think of the name of the show. Yeah, we did a good talk about 5G. Um, so... Yes, that's right. He did. Uh, Seraphim Rose had a Buddhist period, of course, before becoming Orthodox. Worski. What about Worski? Anyway. <laughs> Alan Watts will make you Orthodox quicker than anybody? Interesting. Buddhism. All right, thank you guys. We had a we had a fun night tonight. Uh, I might do a stream later tonight. We might do a philosophy theology, or I might just wait till tomorrow. I'll have more energy tomorrow. I'm uh, waylaid from seven hours of driving yesterday, and then six or seven hours of driving a couple of days before. So, um, fun stream tonight. Get the sh get the episode. I mean, the book, if you guys want it. And uh, God bless everybody. And thank you for the super chats. Much appreciated. Um, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Look for the, the, the philosophy theology stream in the next day or two. Happy New Year's. God bless everybody. Great 2018. We hit 30K. I wanted to hit 50K. That's okay. Again, somebody was dissing me, being like, it, you've been making videos since... 2008 and you only got 30,000 no I haven't I didn't start making videos until two years ago bro so we went from 3k to 30k in two years so keep talking smack bro everything you say bounces off me and sticks to you great year esoteric Hollywood 2 came out great year we, we put Hollywood decoded out great year got to hang out in la got to be on the documentary with oliver stone and sean stone 2018 what else great happened in 2018 spoke in la went to laurel canyon we filmed the sizzle reel for a new tv show in la 2018 don't want to forget anybody we did a lot of really great interviews in 2017 didn't do as many interviews with with people in 2018 uh, we did we went on coast to coast again 2018 we did some Clyde Lewis in 2018 that was that was killer I, I did some really good Clyde Lewis interviews 2017 and 18 those didn't get a lot of views but uh, they came out really good mm, what else happened we went on George Norrie's TV show 2018 that was great that was uh, pretty epic hang out with George Norrie 2018 what else happened I'd say 2018 was the, the, the most epicest Jay's analysis year, for sure. I mean, we, we really went to the next level in 2018. There's no doubt about that. Um, 2017 was big, you know, with the book just coming out at the beginning of the year, 20, December 2016, right into 17. Um, and then we had the TV show in the works 2017. That was good. So, but 20, 2018 was the most epicest year. Uh, a lot of battles, a lot of victories, a lot of big interviews, big shows. Uh, so hopefully 2019, God willing, Lord be with us, will be even as epicest uh, as, as 2019, maybe even bigger. Maybe we can expand in 2019. I hope so. Thanks to all you guys. Definitely hit like, hit share, uh, click your notifications, all of that good stuff. And let's let's get ready for 
a wild 20. Oh, yeah, we had the big debates. Can't forget about that. 2018's big debates with the big name folks. JF, the Richard debate, Robert Taylor debates. Kokesh debate was 2017. Who else did we debate in 2018? That Calvinist dude. We had some big debates in 2018. That was good stuff. I would the, the Nick the Fuentes debate was 2018. Great year, man! What a great year. Sold a lot of books in 2018. That was good. That was good. New website now, so we had a rough patch there with the website. Turned out for the good. Everything worked out for the good. In God's providence. Got another super chat there. Thank you for tactical boomerism. Did you ever watch or analyze the Gotthard uh, tunnel opening ceremony? That did come up. We I talked about it back when I did an interview with Sophia Smallstorm. Uh, if you look up that old interview, it's in there. Underground bases video or talk. Which there's some really good info in that video. Uh, I don't understand why people think the underground bases thing is a crazed conspiracy theory. I mean, I've no, I've talked about it for over a decade. It's obviously real. It does relate to conspiracy stuff. And everybody thought that was super crazy until the Gothard tunnel thing. And I was like, hello, I've been, I've been talking about this for over a decade. Yeah, obviously, duh. And then people were like, whoa, it's like there's something satanic connected to underground bases. Yeah, we've been talking about it for a decade, dude. Um, but I just recently did another video or something where we talked about the underground Gothard tunnel video. I mean... There, it's so in your face. Come on. Uh, I don't remember what other video where, or stream where we talked about it, but we talked about it somewhere. But it, it is in the uh, Sophia Smallstorm interview um, from a while back. Yeah, everybody seems to remember the JF debate the most. Oh, Sticks. I forgot about we had a great uh, religious discussion with Sticks. Uh, kind of a debate there. Um, I can't even remember all the debates. And some dude yesterday was like, all your views are fake. You've never debated anybody. Oh, the debate with uh, Dr. Feingold, PhD Thomas to debate. Yeah, they're all fake. Yeah, debating PhD Thomas. Yeah, it's all fake. Yeah, debating like, you know, well-known YouTubers. Oh, it's all fake. Yeah. So, yeah, great year. And it was a great year thanks to you guys. Um, yeah, the Nick Fuentes debate on Catholicism. That was a good debate. Oh, the debate with Infidel. Forgot about Infidel Pharaoh. We had we had our long time coming debate. Um, it just kind of happened on Boiler Room. Oh, the vegan gains debate. Does that even count as a debate? I don't even know if that counts. What's that other guy? Ask yourself. <laughs> I don't even count. See, I don't even count that one as a debate, but. But I guess. <laughs> Boomer debate. Oh, the Jim Go Boomer debate. You know, that was a fake debate, though, but kind of a debate. That vegan gains thing, that was crazy, wasn't it? I can't believe that didn't get more views than it did. That's the first time I've seen a video with like 6,000, 7,000 views and like 500 comments. And you know how YouTube automatically deletes comments. So the real comment count was like six or 700. And then when you click to see the comments, it from my vantage point, it, like it drops back down because of YouTube's automatic deleting. Uh, it drops back down to like four or five hundred, but that I, I don't I don't know about the numbers on that video. I don't think they're right. I think that video had a lot more views than the numbers were showing. Um, but that was a crazy talk, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, it just I don't know. That was a wild one. Uh, one for the record books. But, oh, yeah, uh, Tristan and I, Primal Edge and I, will be doing some more streams this week. Everybody likes those. We have a lot of fun joking around, cutting up 
cutting up in the back of class, making fools of ourselves on streams. We'll be doing some streams this week. Um, I seem like there's another debate I'm forgetting. I don't know. We're just chilling, having fun here. Was there another debate? Remember Robert Taylor? <laughs> Those debates. That guy, man. Oh, man. Those are fun. Yeah, in my from I'm not being arrogant, but no, I don't think we lost any debates in 2018. Um, I don't think I've lost a debate since I had an argument with a blogger uh, back in 2008. The last time I remember losing a debate was on a was on a comment thread on a blog in 2008. I lost one and a half debates back in 2008 <laughs> um, with da Daniel Jones. So Daniel Jones beat me in a debate back in 2008. Uh, he's part of the reason that I converted to orthodoxy. And James Kelly halfway to beat me, halfway to beat me, beat me in a debate in 2008. Uh, and he's also part of the reason that I converted to orthodoxy. So, so I give Daniel Jones and and uh, James Kelly half credit. He gets half a credit. So, those are the comment thread debates. But come on, everybody's going to lose a debate at some point. But since 2008, I, I don't recall having lost a debate and I don't recall ever losing a debate to an atheist because they're all kind of the same, right? It's kind of like, you know, already know every argument they're going to make for the most part. Uh, oh, that was a fun joke debate. The we was Kang's debate on, uh, uh, Worski. That was a hilarious one. That was fun. You know, half those debates aren't real debates anyway, but, I'm not really afraid to debate anybody because we already know, like there's, there's, if you are an atheist or material, it's like you're limited in the kinds of positions that you could take. Um, it would be interesting to branch out and have like a Muslim debate or a Jewish debate or something like that would be fun to branch out and do, or, or a neo-pagan, that would be fun to do. I'd debate any of those guys, I'm not afraid of that. Um, there's not any real position like that that I'm not afraid to debate any of those people. Uh, if it got into the specifics of like something to do with an area that I don't know about, like DNA or something like that, like really precise about that, you know, I don't have graduate level training in that. Um, but on the philosophical point, I'm not afraid to debate anybody. Uh, I can't think of any, any, I'm trying to think of any thinkers that, that, I mean, most of the people that are promoted as thinkers, they're, they're not really thinkers they're kind of propped up you know like of jordan peterson types or a uh i wouldn't be afraid to debate stefan molyneux or anybody like that on atheism but we all know you know that's those people aren't going to debate uh, there's there's no again I, everybody every day people ask me why don't you debate stefan molyneux why don't you debate jordan peterson look those level people are never going to debate a small name person because there's no incentive to do it they have a lot to lose and nothing to gain so if you can grow my channel to, <laughs> to be giant, uh, maybe then, uh, I don't think Matt Dillahunty was interested. I think there was one email sent to him and I think he replied back like, maybe who is this? I don't know who this is. And then Matt Dillahunty was like, for, he just wasn't interested. So anyway, David Bentley Hart will never debate. <clears throat> um, I don't really want, I don't know. I don't really want to debate that, that guy at all. Debate Obama. That would be funny. Henry Kissinger debate myself in the mirror. Debate electric universe theory. I don't really have a problem with electric universe theory. I think it's entirely possible. Not really have any strong point on that i want to debate mark passio that's it mark passio benny wills was wanting to set up a debate with mark passio i think that'd be fun yeah i'd love to do that it'd be a lot of fun uh if if mark passio would do it i'll do it i'll debate stefan molyneux or, Jordan, or any of them if they, i don't think they'll do it but i would i would love to debate uh uh, uh mark passio that would be a really fun debate because we could debate uh, natural law theory, how viable that is. 
Um, a reasonable debate with a believer in ghosts. <laughs> uh, I think it's possible ghosts exist. So Ben Shapiro, uh, he's not going to debate anybody small, lesser name. Uh, I don't think I want to debate Michael Tessarian. I don't think I'm going to debate that guy. Debate Maxine. Uh, debate Maxine Waters. Uh, uh, there's a Trump person. Uh, debate Maxine Waters. Uh, that would be a fun debate. Who do you guys want to see? I tell you, the only the way to do this is to just constantly tweet them until they do it. Vox Day doesn't want to do a debate. I thought it would be great to have a chat with Vox Day. We could have a, a, a an interesting dialogue because. Uh, it would be neat to see him introduced to orthodox ideas. It would be a lot of fun if Vox Day would be willing to do that. Debate Nick Cage, that would be great. i would be on that in a heartbeat. I would intentionally lose to Nick Cage. Like, even if I could beat Nick Cage, I would lose to Nick Cage. So, we already had a kind of half debate with Styx. Um, he wanted to do more of a conversation, but it is more or less a debate. Uh... True Del Tom uh, wanted to do a show. We didn't want to do a debate. And then he, I think he said he had some issues with his Discord. So he said he wanted to put it off. So uh, if he wants to set that up again, I'd be glad to uh, either have a debate or do a chat. I think he wanted to basically just have a philosophy chat, which is fine with me. I'm always open to do both. I think people, I'm not after people like, I'm going to take you down. Uh, I'm always open to doing a conversation doesn't have to be a debate, but I'm always open to do a debate if a person wants to do it. Um, but debate an old school atheist evolutionist. I'm always open to debating any atheist. They're always, they're always welcome. Uh, there are qualifications. I'm not going to debate every guy with a channel that has 30 subscribers who says, if you don't debate me, you're a coward. No, I mean... Preferably, I prefer people to have a degree and to have a book or a website or something public. Uh, otherwise, there's no incentive for me to debate. I'm not afraid of losing to a guy with 30 subscribers, but I'm not going to debate. There's, I, don't get any, I don't gain anything from debating some dude with 30 subscribers. So you need to have some following. You need to have some. Uh, it's not that I value academia that much. I always run it down. Uh, especially modern day academia. But if a person does have a philosophy degree, I know that they are at least going to be trained in some basics of philosophy because people that don't have a degree in philosophy or don't have a college degree, generally speaking, even though there is a lot of BS in academia, you're still at least going to be exposed to a basic logic class, hopefully uh, a basic um, critical thinking class, um, and maybe basic philosophy, right? Because it's very difficult to debate these people who, like infidel, like they're so focused on science, they don't have any knowledge of philosophy at all. Uh, and they don't even understand the things that they're disagreeing with. And it's like, it's very difficult to do that. So it's helpful if a person has, you know, kind of a basic understanding of philosophy. Now, if I don't really care that much about a college degree, so I'm not trying to skate around debating anyone. It's just that, uh, it makes it a little easier to determine. I know that they've been through the university ringer and they've had to write papers. If you've had to write dozens of papers that are dozens of pages on philosophy, then I know that you will know what you're talking about. Okay. If you haven't been through that ringer of having to write hundreds of pages over years, uh, you know, doing a philosophy degree, doing a master's degree in philosophy, then I know that you're not, you're, you're just talking smack. It's just hot air coming out of you. Uh, anyway. So this is getting really boring. Well, then, uh, get out of here. We don't need you. Anyway, I, we were just trying to figure out people to debate. So if you think that's boring, then get out of here. All right, so, yeah, debate. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with debating any of these people. I don't know who David Woods is, but uh, I don't understand why they, why they don't want to come on. Uh, you know, I mean, this channel's grown to be a decent sized channel. You know, I mean, 30,000 isn't massive, but it's nothing to snub your nose at. So, you know, if you want to get some, some, some exposure, any people can come on debate. So anyway, hopefully 2019 we'll have some hot debates, some steamy debates for you guys. And we'll have a new TV show, hopefully, Lord willing, if that works out, be great. Um, I guess I'll work on Esoteric Hollywood 3. Everybody seems to be happy with, with part two. Maybe we'll make a three. Um, and I'd like to eventually get some philosophy and theology into book form. That would be, that would be worth doing as well. I've been, been, been wanting to do that for a long, long, long time. And uh, maybe in God's providence we'll be ready to do that. So God bless. Hope you guys have a good night. And uh, I'll see you guys soon. Oh, E. Michael Jones already declined doing debate. So every day somebody says debate. E. Michael Jones. Will you go to Anarchapuco? If I'm invited to Anarchapuco, I will go and I will speak or debate whatever they want me to do. Sure. I'll, I don't I don't usually, I think pretty much every speaking engagement I've been invited to, I've said yes. I can't remember turning down any speaking engagements, but those don't come a lot. You get, you only get, so far, I've only had you know, about two or three speaking engagements a year. Um, but if they invite me to Anarchapuco, I can't even say it. I will, I will go. Uh, anyway. All right. Have